Welcome, everybody. It looks like the floodgates have opened and everybody's coming in. Uh, thank you so much for attending. Please stop by the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. We'd love to know where you're attending from. This presentation is being recorded. And it's also got honking, too. So this presentation is being recorded. And uh, if you missed anything, don't worry about it. The replay will be made available to everybody uh, during, uh, I'm sorry, afterwards, a couple of days maybe afterwards. So we're really, really delighted that you guys are here. Uh, we've got a, a nice full schedule of information for you today. And it's wonderful to see so many people excited about the total solar eclipse that we're having in April of 2024. Uh, but the tools that Gabe and I are going to give you today are going to be helpful for all future eclipses, although we do have this one really, really wonderful event coming up. So, hey, Gabe, did that car stop honking yet? It did. It did. Okay. But, but, you know, we, we, we are in Brooklyn here, and it's uh, opposite side uh, parking day, so, you know, there might be some of that coming in. So please forgive me. We, we have people from all the way. We got Norway, Armenia, Auckland. Mm -hmm. Wow. All over the Ontario. place. Well, yeah, the, the Nova Flex crowd is awesome and global. Thank you guys yeah. for showing up on force. Woohoo. All right. So uh, we probably have uh, Brenda and Martin in the chat also. Uh, Gabe and I have a lot of links and stuff to share. So keep looking at the chat. One final bit of housekeeping. Uh, please use the Q&A if you want to ask a question. Uh, if you want to talk amongst yourselves, use the chat. Um, we can promote a question that you have to a Q&A if you accidentally use the wrong one. No problem. But we prefer to use the Q&A. And speaking of questions, please ask every question that you have. We want to answer all the questions. Uh, we will probably hold questions until the end, unless it's something that's worth stopping the presentation for. But Gabe and I have put months of time into this. We're years. ready to give you years, years of time into this. <laughs> ready to give you a download. Uh, and uh, who's ready to go? You ready, Gabe? I just, shout out. We got some people that have shared eclipses with us in here, and that's pretty cool. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, exactly. Look at that. I see Sue. I see. <laughs> I see a lot of names. In fact, I thought my glasses were good enough, but apparently I can't read. <laughs> it's that small right now at this distance from my screen. But thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. All right. Without further ado, let's hop right in. Uh, everybody let us know if you can see what's going on with the screen share. And uh, Gabe, why don't you kick it off for us? Thanks, Matt. I, you know, it, it's, it's so great. We live right now uh, in this golden age of eclipses. And the technology has caught up. It's here in America. So uh, since 2017, which again, we have several of the, 20, uh, the 2017 uh, eclipsers in the room right now. But it, let's think of this timeline just for a second. And I want every each and every one of you to think of your own personal timeline and experiences with eclipses, because each and every one is so special. I remember the one as a kid in 19, I think it was 79, um, that was really just always on the TV. It would just hit uh, a little bit of Oregon at that point. But, you know, there was this fascination and still not understanding about what eclipses are. Um, and even if you should go out or, you know, or stay inside and not get hurt by the sun's rays. Um, but things really have picked up immensely since the 2017 eclipse. Um, that came across a huge swath of America, digital cameras, solar filters, tripods, everything um, was really made for this, let's call it a perfect storm of the moon eclipsing the sun. And it was really amazing. It was one of the most documented eclipses ever. And we've been documenting them for a very long time, thousands of years, really, um, but now, as we, we're coming to sort of the last great American eclipse in a while, it's going to be another 20, 30 years until we get a nice chunk of it coming back to the continental U.S. Um, the fascination is building up, and we really want to best prepare you how to photograph and experience the eclipse. Now, Matt and I shared the 2017 eclipse. I'll say together 
because we were both doing something at the eclipse, even though we were in different states. But um, we were not together, but we talked about it. And each one of us had a different, a, 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 quite a different experience. I was with a small group of people in Idaho. Matt was with thousands of people in probably the best location of clear skies in eastern, uh, in eastern Oregon with Atlas Obscura. Uh, and each one of us talked about it like as soon as we could right after because it's a monumental experience. You can't, there's nothing like it. Uh, and we eagerly looked forward to the next one, which we'd have been documenting lunar eclipses even before that. We're gonna focus on solar eclipses today. Um, but Matt and I just really came off the high of our first ever annular eclipse in October in Capitol Reef. And that one was extraordinary. That was so fun. You know, Matt, it was it was perfect. Yeah. I have to say it was it was absolutely perfect. Um, you never know, you know, you got to throw your dice, you know, out there and see, what you know, but you don't, don't, don't know the numbers coming up and just everything worked out yeah. uh, perfectly. The weather, the amount of people. Uh, the ex overall experience. It just was amazing, amazing, amazing. And, you know, we hope that our luck continues uh, here in uh, on April 8th. We're throwing our, our, our lot in with uh, Hot Springs uh, in Arkansas. Yeah. And uh, that could be a very, very interesting eclipse. But I want you to think about the eclipses you have. Definitely feel free to share those stories in the chat about where you were, how many eclipses you've experienced. Um, because, you know, hopefully in the end here, you know, we'll all become some version of eclipsers, whether we continue to chase them throughout our lives, any in the middle of the ocean, Antarctica, or any little bit of land that it, it dips on, or if we wait for it to come to us. But either way, you have to experience a total solar eclipse. Just saying that right now, find a way make it happen. Yeah. It happened a couple times, you know, they, eclipse, solar eclipses happen a couple times a year, but the total ones are a little bit more rare, but um, you really, really make it part of uh, your life experience to uh, witness the eclipse. So, and like this webinar, it brings us all together in ways that we probably otherwise would not have been spending time together. Unlikely you know, to spend that sort of time together in those places. So it's it's a departure from normal life to do something extraordinary. So many people can yeah. be dedicating that time to experience yeah. that one thing that you can, even if you're not like Matt and I weren't together in 2017, we can talk about it and relate and and laugh and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, have a beer about it. <laughs> it's positive where, where were you when events happened, you know? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Nice. All right. Well, it's, that being said, let's get started. Um, so what is our agenda today? We got a lot to cover. So buckle up. But again, as Matt said, this is being recorded. So if you have to dip out, don't mind. Uh, we This recording will be coming out and you can watch it again and again or the bits and parts that you missed. But uh, we're going to go through really four four sort of themes and then obviously have a QA. and a We're going to talk about what are eclipses. We're going to talk about how to plan uh, to photograph them. And we're going to talk about the gear, of course, that goes into that because there are some specific gear or gear considerations uh, to uh, to consider. And then at Runa, we we're each going to have a, a breakout session where we're going to process uh, our eclipse, our past eclipse photos. And then at the end, we will have a Q&A. So if we look at, let's look at, I love, to be honest, I love history. And I have been doing um, a really deep dive into sort of the history of eclipses, what are eclipses. We don't really have a, lot, a ton of time to go into the history of eclipses, but stay tuned. We've got some uh, something to announce a little bit later that will go really into depth about that. But let's think of that. I know, and I know a lot of us understand that, but I really want you to understand it. And I, you know, to wrap your head around how, how our universe, how the sun, moon, and earth interact. An eclipse is, is a term. We always think of it, obviously, with the sun, moon, earth, but it can happen with any celestial body. Um, something can get in front of, eclipse the other one. Um, so in, in, with us, what we really love and, and look forward to is when earth or the moon eclipse one another due to their positioning with the sun. 
okay? And we create a shadow. Either Earth creates a shadow over the moon, that's a lunar eclipse, or the moon creates a much smaller shadow and hides the sun from a very, very specific and small area of Earth, okay? Fun fact, solar eclipse occurs when there's a new moon, for example, the dark side of the moon, again, passes between the sun and the earth, casting that little, again, that little shadow on that specific part of earth. The lunar eclipse is, again, that exact opposite and happens during a full moon, okay? So always kind of think about that. And then we can say, well, you know, why don't we have eclipses every full moon and new moon? That would be awesome. Right. I mean, just imagine that. But again, we'd probably be bored and be like, oh, yeah, it's just another eclipse going on instead of being as special as they are. But the orbit of the moon is off, is a little tilted by five degrees. That's why it doesn't happen every lunar month when there's a new moon or a full moon. And that's why it does happen. There are lunar, there are anyway from one to five lunar and solar eclipses a year. But whether it's total or not depends on if everything aligns just perfect. Okay, so let's we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, oop, what, what do I? There we go. We have to share this. Uh, we have a video to share, Matt. I love this little GIF from the uh, NASA's uh, Goddard Space Station. So this really gives you an idea of, you know, the moon again, whenever we see a new moon where we don't see, or we only see the dark side of the moon, that means the sun, you know, is behind and, and we're not, we're not getting it. We're not seeing it. That, this right here, this is the lunar eclipse. Uh, sorry, this is the, sorry, my mistake. This is the solar eclipse. And you can just see the umbra, which is that bigger shadow or so the smaller shadow and the penumbra, the bigger shadow falling on the earth. I love this gif. Um, really has a, a, a great graphic way of sharing it. Let's go back to the slideshow. And this is another uh, oop, this is another easier graph perhaps to see, where we again we see for a solar eclipse, the sun, then we have the moon is in between the sun and the earth. And then again, we see that umbra and penumbra. We can see that, you know, the 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 penumbra, which is the overall shadow, and that's really where you just see the bite of uh, the sun kind of uh, being taken out, that is a much bigger area and kind of goes out. Whereas the umbra, which is the smaller area, is a sharper, smaller shadow that again is your path of totality, falls on a very small and, and very uh, specific part of the earth and creates that path of totality as we rotate, um, as the earth rotates. So again, and here's sort of a breakdown, so you have it in the notes. And like I said at the beginning, the important thing is to find yourself in the umbra, the, the path of totality. That is where really things change. You know, we it's a it's a kind of a full blackout. We we the, the, the all the lights are out, animals become quiet, like it's so amazing, you know, when we hear birdsong just stop or insects just fly to the ground and, and ourselves, it just, we go from basically a, uh, a regular normal day, whether it's 10 a.m. or 4 p.m., you know, to all of a sudden phasing into twilight, just like that. And it is, you, you, the temperature drops, it's again, that experience, I can say the things but in order really to experience it, you must be in the umbra, the path of totality. The deeper you're in that umbra, the longer you're going to experience that total solar eclipse. The penumbra, sometimes that's just, you know, again, we have, like I said, usually two to up to four or five solar eclipses a year. Some the pen, and most of the time they are penumbra or partial eclipses, where again, we'll just see a bite of the um, the sun being taken out uh, by the moon. You're not going to see darkness. You might not even see it because it maybe it just bites a little bit of the uh, sun away, but hopefully it kind of gets to a, a thinner crescent. Um, and that will make a still a spectacular viewing, but 
by try, try, try to get into the umbra. Here's a, a you know a bird's eye view. We always look at, or let's call it a moon's eye view. We always see the eclipse while we're inside it from Earth. You know, so either we see it or we don't. An umbra, umbra. This is pretty amazing. I love this shot. Again, goes to the Go 16 satellite for really looking at what the shadow of the moon looks like on Earth during. And during that solar eclipse, this is, I mean, to me, it looks like a hurricane, right? You know, it looks like this, you know, it's swerving all around. And that swath of like tendrils that you're seeing around there, that is, you know, part of the path, but it's also part of the penumbra. And it's that darkest area in the middle that you will, um, that is the uh, umbra. And we have a little video. I love this visual, but we have a little video to share of how this realistically crosses, again, shot by the GO-16 satellite uh, across our globe. Okay, so here it is darkness. Here's the light, the sun coming out, and then there's the eclipse passing through. That's where the uh, that little you know, black dot that you'll see come across Sun comes up, gets intersected in that part by the moon, and that path of totality streaks across the Pacific Ocean and into uh, southern Southern America there. Very, very cool. Um, great way to kind of see, again, what's happening from uh, the outside. Oop, there we go. So again, let's look at this. I showed you the graph of a solar eclipse, and we see the kind of shadow that's created. A lunar eclipse, which usually again happens a couple times a year, but not always, um, is is quite easier to experience, easier to photograph, uh, and is a bigger shadow. You could look at that. That umbra is really large and basically takes over the whole moon. It's not just shining on a little part of the moon; it's shining on the whole moon. And that's when when that happens. That's when we get that blood moon the red of the moon, where basically the only thing illuminating the moon is the little bit of the, the sun sets and the sun rises that are kind of scraping across the poles or the, the, really the outskirts of the earth. That little bit of light is, is basically lighting up the moon and making it red. Um, these usually last a couple hours. Um, and it's a little bit, it, it's quite easier uh, to experience, to photograph, no need for specialty filters, glasses, et cetera, et cetera. And Matt, you've got a phenomenal picture, one of my favorite ones of a lunar eclipse. Let's share that and maybe talk about how you, uh, your experience. Sure. Oh, geez, we both clicked. <laughs> <laughs> so this, uh, this composition happens from the wee hours in the morning of November 8th, 2022, until dusk. And that's why you see that sort of pinkish, purpley sky there. And you see the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna draw here for a second so I can get the colors right. I'm gonna use this color, there we go. You can see as it goes down this way that it starts to, that is a terrible arrow. As it goes down this way, <laughs> that it starts to fade in there. Um, and it what happened was the sun the the twilight started to happen during the full lunar eclipse but i i built the composition in such a way that they naturally faded into each other um and we'll talk about focal lengths and stuff but you'll see that i i called out that this is 63 millimeters i made a judgment call on site that i wanted the appearance of the moon to be larger and to since it was perfectly or near perfectly echoing the same angle, but the opposite of the Rip Van Winkle Bridge there uh, over the Catskill Mountains, I wanted them to to talk to each other. So this is one of the things that we're going to talk about as strategies. But like, where is the object that you're photographing going, and how can you use that artfully? So this this was something I did standing alone on the top of a hill looking over the Hudson River 
uh, all alone with permission in a state park. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I totally dig shooting lunar eclipses, uh, and it's, uh, it's better with friends. So, uh, but we're here to talk about solar eclipses. Yeah. So let's move on from that. Well, I, I just want to call out, Matt, just that I love that shot, the composition so much. And I feel that the road, the, the, the car trails mm -hmm. and, and the moon are leading to the pot of gold. <laughs> you know, so that's uh, I love the symmetry there. Really, really, really beautiful colors um, and everything. And to get, you know, but yes, we, again, I just, just wanted to understand eclipses uh, as a whole. Um, they happen every year, uh, seize them. But today's focus is on uh, the different, uh, is on solar eclipses. So let's uh, spend a couple moments because there are, I said there's, you know, anywhere from one to four solar eclipses a year. And you're like, no, there's not. There's only a, a total eclipse happens every like couple years. You know, maybe it hits land every 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. But hold on, hold on. There's again, different types of solar eclipses. Each one has its own, uh, it, it, you know, its own style and its own way to capture it. Uh, so let's take a look at the different types of solar eclipses. First one, the most common one, is a partial solar eclipse. And this is when, again, the sun, moon, and earth are lined up, but not just right, right? Again, we talked about the moon, its orbit being five degrees tilted, so it doesn't line up all the time. So, but it does, the orbits do collide, you know, or go around each other, right? So um, there, there. this is a frequent, thing. Um, what we'll see is only part of the moon, sorry, only part of the sun being obscured by the moon, giving it somewhat of a crescent shape. And that's cool. I think uh, the crescent is a powerful uh, shape. So, you know, capturing that is still unique, uh, perhaps capturing it you know, hopefully if it's low to the ground or something like that against a structure instead of just up in the sky, I think that's where the power of a partial solar eclipse will be. Now, also remember that, you know, we all, when we go out to see a, a total solar eclipse bonus, we also get, you know, the partial solar eclipse at right before it happens. You kind of get two, a, a two for one there that because there's a time where you're in the penumbra until you get to the umbra and then into the penumbra. And that's where those great composites of the whole full phase of the sun come from is because you've experienced it all. Um, so that partial solar eclipse happens. That's, you know, but it, the technical term for a partial solar eclipse is when, you know, when basically we're not getting a fully aligned either annular or total solar eclipse. Still fun. Um, still creative. Don't don't sleep on them. You know, find a way to to capture it and make it um, make it amazing. Also, this uh, partial solar eclipse, you should always have your solar filters on the whole time. Okay. Then we'll talk about the annual, the ring of fire, the annular solar eclipse. We're just hot off of this one. How many people here? Uh, drop that in the chat. Drop it. Drop where you saw it. Um, if you saw it and where you saw it in the chat right here, again, Matt and myself and a, a couple other people in this room saw it in Capitol Reef, Utah. It was uh, that, that path uh, of totality, of the annular totality for this annular solar eclipse was pretty amazing. Uh, went through a couple national parks, went through Chaco Canyon, which has been, uh, which is not the first time there's actually actually documentation of a total solar eclipse happening in Chaco Canyon before from over 2000 years ago. Um, so amazing. Uh, this, this was our first um, annular uh, ring of fire solar eclipse. It was awesome. It was, if you can't get a total, an annular is like second best as far as the experience. You don't get to twilight twilight because everything aligns Really, everything lines mostly perfectly. However, the moon is either at or near its farthest point uh, from Earth. So what that means is basically it'll get in front, it'll get right in front of the moon, but it won't cover it all. So again, there'll be that ring of fire uh, all the way around it. It's, it's an amazing thing to shoot. 
again, keep your filters on the whole time. This is not something where you can, um, you can, you can, you can take your filters off. Uh, however, I will say there is a, a slight Corona effect and you can see some of the Bailey's beads and some of the other things that are just, you think of, I think we think of just for a total eclipse, but you can see them if your exposures are right, if you're zoomed, you know, if you got the right gear uh, specifically. So um, great, great experience, the annular solar eclipse. These seem to be a little bit rarer and aren't hitting land for uh, quite, uh, quite a bit of time. So um, this might have been the last one that I might see. I hope not. I hope to to find to find one, and and make it happen again. And then, of course, you know the one the one the reason why we're all here, um, and the and the reason why we're all so excited uh, is the total solar eclipse. And this is when everything is perfect, perfectly aligned, um, and weather permitting. You can see the sun's corona, which you see right here. Bailey's beads, which you kind of see those red little uh, specks that are coming through uh, the moon. The cool thing, Bailey's beads, that's basically little bits of sun that, you know, the moon is not perfectly circular. It's got mountains and valleys right in it. So sometimes just a little pin prick, like a pinhole of light kind of comes through. And that's what the Bailey's uh, uh, comes through the moon. That's the Bailey's beads. So you're looking basically through the valleys and mountains of the moon. And then the diamond ring effect, which we'll talk about. Uh, and I, I think I have some pictures to show of that one later. But that's the last lick of light that you get uh, of the sun before the moon completely eclipses it. This is the only type of eclipse that you can, again, take off your protective eyewear. You can also take off your solar filters from your camera to really fully uh, experience the corona and the total eclipse. Well, what, who put this slide in here? Wait, there's more? There's another type of eclipse? Oh, boy. All right. Yeah, and I'll tell you something. It happened last year, and not many people talked about it, but there is one more even rarer type of solar eclipse, and that is the hybrid solar eclipse. Now this gets, we're getting into, into some crunching of the, math, of the math here because the Earth, as we know it, it, its surface is curved. So sometimes an eclipse can, can shift between annular and total. So you won't be able to experience both of them at the same time, but depending upon where you are on the path of totality, whether it's totality for the annular or totality for the total, this one eclipse during that path, you can choose to experience one or the other. And that might be obviously dependent upon what land it, it, it lands on or if you want to go on, on a ship. But a hybrid eclipse is, uh, is, 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 is sort of a really, really rare thing. Um, and, and basically it happens when the distance between the Earth and the moon are so finely balanced that the curvature of that Earth, again, comes into play. Uh, the last hybrid eclipse was April 20th, 2023, so almost a year ago. Uh, I believe it was over in Indonesia area. Uh, I think it might even hit, start Australia up to Indonesia. And the next hybrid solar eclipse will be on November 14th, 2031. So pretty cool thing. Um, and you get your choice, whether you, depending upon where you are, whether it's going to be it's going to be that annular or total eclipse. However, I think the reason why we're all in this room is for the upcoming 2024 Great American, uh, or North American, I should call it, the Great North American Eclipse that, that's happening, um, again, April, 20, April 8th, starting from Mexico and going all the way up to Newfoundland. Now, Here's again, let's just for those of you who are new to this, or as a reminder for those of us who have experienced it before, you know, I think we all get obsessed with okay, how much time of totality do we have? And we try to go to the area that's got the most amount, the, the most amount of totality. We only had a little over two minutes for the 2017 eclipse. We're almost doubling that for the for this year's 
April 8th eclipse. So that's cool. The highest point, the longest uh, uh, to uh, total totality will be four minutes and 27 seconds. But most of, of the uh, North America mainland is going to experience it for more than three minutes. So pretty amazing. Very cool. Should provide lots of opportunity to photograph, but also lots of hopefully some opportunity for you to just enjoy. One thing that this graph is doing a great job of showcasing is that the whole experience of the eclipse is usually about three to four hours, right? So if we see here, you know, the, we that the first sort of the first eclipse point happens about an hour and fifteen minutes prior to when totality hits your location, and then goes for another hour and fifteen minutes afterwards, approximately. So. That's, we want to be there. I, I don't know, anyone in this room doesn't want to show up 10 minutes at, before the eclipse, right? You know, that's, that's not, we're, 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 we're photographers here. So we're going to show up like 10 days before the eclipse and then show up to the location 10 hours before the eclipse and really hone in and get, get excited and make sure that everything is, uh, is perfect. So, uh, but just remember, again, you, you, you have all, all in all, you know, there's plenty of people that watch the eclipse. Once it's over, they go out to eat. They, they try to start leave and stuff like that. Commit, realize that you're committing minimal four hours and probably double that to stake your claim uh, in a spot and be there for the whole experience. Matt, let's, this is a cool video let's show this one because this shows the entire path of totality as it starts in the pacific ocean and touches base uh in mexico uh you know the coast of mexico the the, the hot spot for so many people was uh mazalatan that town there it's a beach town resort town i'm probably slaughtering the name but that at the beginning we will have the most the beginning of the eclipse you have the most uh, around that beginning phase. You're going to have that most time, and that's one of the places. I, as soon as we found out, you know, we, like two, three years ago, we looked, and already hotels <laughs> out in Mexico were sold out. But then we kind of come in through. Here we go from getting out of Mexico and into Texas. But also look at this again. Let's look at that shadow of the moon, shadow of the eclipse, the the moon shadow on you know the path it's round right ah we we realize that but now everything kind of makes sense that the longest point of totality is going to be kind of right in the middle of that path because that's your going to have your longest distance if you're just on the edge you're just getting that like rounded edge of of the moon so you might get like half the time or only just less than a minute of time so that's the importance we notice this path of totality but getting into the middle of the path of totality is key. So here we are, we're going Texas, Oklahoma, will be in Arkansas, Hot Springs, but Little Rock is also uh, gonna be really, really cool. And again, here's uh, this path going through so much of the United States, there's gonna be, we don't know, but I think that there was a fact that there's like 11 million people that are along, that live along the path of totality. Um, and so what is that even going to look like as people kind of converge? Here comes Indianapolis. Um, uh, Car Carbondale, fun fact, they were in the last year's, uh, 2017's uh, path of totality and this year's. The people of Carbondale should have sold their houses or rented them big time. And now we're getting <laughs> just below four minutes of totality also. Exactly, right? So now we're getting under the four minutes uh, of it. But looking at that, that... Look at how the speed of mo the moon shadow. That thing's that thing's motoring, <laughs> you know. So these are all you know should play a factor. That duration of totality. Hopefully you can be there for again over three minutes. Hopefully get to uh, to uh, to four minutes. But now we're getting into New York. New York is going to be a hot spot in Canada. Serenade uh, Lake. There you go. Your your old home. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, now, of this region, though, I will say, and Jay, I know you you said you're doing the, the Newfoundland one. That's going to be tricky just because up up sort of in that East Coast area, weather comes into play. 
right? Weather comes into play. Uh, the chance of clouds at the beginning of April are high. Uh, that being said, even if we can kind of get a sneak, a little bit of a peak of the eclipse, even through light clouds, it's a pretty cool shot. And then here's sort of the last place it touches uh, Earth in Newfoundland area before emptying out into the Atlantic Ocean. So looks, I, I posted a, a link to the website this came from, the greatamericaneclipse.com in the chat. Have fun browsing that website if you haven't already spent many hours on it. Uh, it was really, really clever of them to make this video to really help visualize. Great that. visual. Great. And then, then, Matt, look at this. At the end of totality, as you can see, it's it's curving there, is nine, uh, under 100 miles. When we started totality at touchdown in Mexico, it was, I think, what, 123. So you lost, right? The totality shrinks as we go around the Earth and as it nears its end. Wow. So really cool um, thing um, regarding that. But here's now, here's kind of the fun facts about this year's eclipse. And Matt, why don't you take it away? I've been talking for a bit. Why don't you take away for the next few slides? Sure, sure. Why don't you take a drink of water? <laughs> right, right. Great work. Uh, so this is an example from from time and date um, where you can, and I just posted the link in the chat, where you can find the place that you, where you'd like to be. So we're sharing all these resources for planning that we have used uh, in hopes that they can help better you plan. That was not good English, but enjoy. So in this example, Little Rock, Little Rock which is close to where we will be, uh, the partial eclipse begins at 1233. Totality begins at 1351. We're in military time here, right? But look over on the right-hand side. You can see the directions there, right? And then the altitude. The altitude is the thing that I pay attention to the most, right? Um, that's how high above the true horizon that the sun is going to be. And this helps you figure out something we'll talk about in a little bit, which is which focal length to use. But if you go out with a protractor or something that helps you understand how many degrees in the sky you are, you know, if straight up is 90 and half of that is 45, this is a little bit up towards halfway in between, you know, 45 degrees and 90. So you can figure out the sun's going to start at 61 degrees and go down to 51 by the time it's there. So when you're planning your photographs, you can plan to either include a foreground or not, depending on all that. But you can see the timing here where it has uh, all this stuff. This stuff will help you as you're, you're doing your planning. So going to websites that help you look at these things, help you think very critically about how to plan. Uh, and we're going to continue talking about that topic now as we get into the nitty gritty. Another great planning tool that we use is photo pills. Um, it is our planning tool of choice at National Parks at Night. Uh, so, hey, thanks, Gabe. <laughs> Look at you pasting in there. So <laughs> this example right here is from when Gabe and I did the annular solar eclipse back in October. And we were in Capitol Reef National Park. Up along the top part, um, and I'm going to draw here, for, forgive my crudeness, there is a, a ribbon that you can swipe back and forth on. So as you swipe, as you tap right here on the, the eclipse part, it'll pop up with something that shows you which one you want to choose. And then you can then swipe over and see all of the details that you just saw. But for the exact location that your pin is right here. So that's the part that is really cool is that the math for that pin is right up here and you can see your exact details for wherever you are instead of just the ones listed on a website. So that's why this tool is, is pretty amazing. Um, so I'm just going to zoom in on that so you can see it. Now you can see also as you swipe through, um, this graphic is going to change too. As you swipe the time down below here, back and forth, as you drag your finger back and forth, this graphic is going to change to visually show you what stage that you're going to be in as it goes through all of these stages on the timeline there. I like my crude drawing. I hope you guys like my crude drink pink drawings. That's awesome. So, uh, yeah, so PhotoPills is an incredible tool to use also. 
one thing that you can't really plan for because I mean, we have a great story about this. When we were in Capitol Reef, we were talking to the Rangers. We said, how many people do you expect to come here? They're like, a lot. <laughs> Can you be more specific? They're like, we honestly have no clue because we've never had an eclipse here while the park has been opened. And there's only one highway that goes through this. So the best we can say is a lot. That's what we're, we're expecting. So Gabe and I, in our workshop group, we planned for a lot. And we got to our location while it was still dark. Uh, mind you, the eclipse was during the from 9 a.m. to noon. So we got there pre-twilight in October. <laughs> so we were there for a long, long time. So we've made night photography, and then we shot our blue hour shots for our base shots. And then we were there for the entirety of the eclipse, and we were ready with picnic lunches to wait for all of the traffic that never came. Contrast that with what happened to me when I was out in Durkee, Oregon with Atlas Obscura, and Gabe was elsewhere. You were in Idaho, right? Uh, I everybody that was with us, there's only that one corridor there, that one major highway that goes east-west through Oregon. People were waiting four, five, six, seven hours to get someplace after the eclipse. So wow. you need to plan for traffic. You need to plan for the worst case scenario because congestion can happen, especially in heavily populated places where more than the residents will be. There will be people traveling to see this. So just a word of caution there. Uh, travel safely, travel smartly, fill up your gas tanks, bring extra food and water. What else should you bring? Well, you know, you need to you need to bring a plan. Your plan is going to make sure that you know where you want to be. Uh, what are the resources there? You know, you got to think about creature needs. Is there a toilet? Right. If not, what what's your backup plan? Right. Um, and you know, how long are you going to stay? You know, you should bring friends. You shouldn't do this alone. Lots of water. We talked about that. Something to sit on is absolutely wonderful. Uh, Gabe and I use these, uh, stools called the walk stool, but anything comfortable to sit on is very nice because standing for three to four hours really hits you in the knees and hips and solar glasses, which we'll talk about. Make sure that everybody has a pair, uh, and backups in case you scratch them or get pinpricks. So let's talk about the photographer part of this. Now we're here. We're going to talk about the photographer part. We recommend setting up for two different shots. The first shot is going to be a composite shot. And you're going to use a wide or a medium lens. What do we mean by that? Because of the height of the sun in the sky, let's say it's around 60 degrees-ish, depending on your location, you should use a wider lens. For the annular solar eclipse, it was lower in the sky. It was somewhere in 40 degrees. So we could use a tighter lens. But because this is much higher, if you want to include the landscape and the sun in the path, you're going to need something a little bit wider. So we're recommending somewhere between 14 to 24 millimeters. Also, your second shot is going to be a tight shot. So you're going to use some sort of telephoto lens or a telescope. Uh, and there's a note here saying that if you're going to use a tracker, if you don't already know how to use it, start practicing now. If you don't feel fluent in using a tracker before you are embarking on this trip, don't ruin your day by trying to use a tracker on a day where it's critical. That's all I'm going to say. So here's a test that I shot in my backyard. I took all of these lenses, my 24 to 70 zoom lens, my 70 to 200 zoom, my Red Cat 51 telescope, which is 250 millimeters a 350 millimeter telescope, which is my Red Cat 71. And both of those are for astro photography. And then my 1250 millimeter Mac 90 telescope. And this is a full size frame. That white box that you see is the 35 millimeter uh, sensor on my camera, which is a, a Z6 II. So this is actual size on the sensor and I just composited them all together. So, now you can see how much of your frame is going to be occupied. Notice the glow around these. That happened because of the filter I chose to use. But when you're shooting a total solar eclipse, you want to make sure there's a little bit of breathing room. 
So come back and look at this graphic when you want to look at it. I think I'm going to shoot, uh, and we'll talk about this, somewhere around 400 millimeters for the total solar eclipse. Um, if you want to choose a focal length, there are some great pre-visualization tools. Uh, Gabe's going to post a link to this astronomy tools calculator here. This is a really, really cool tool. It's going to help you figure out how much of your frame is going to be occupied by the subject that you want to photograph. Now, I just want to say there's a difference between photographic lenses and telescopes. Telescopes generally don't have variable apertures or an iris diaphragm inside it like a photographic lens does. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, you probably haven't bought a telescope yet. Um, but they, they are very sharp for what they do. And sometimes they have a thing you have to add into it called a field flattener. And sometimes that works well for eclipses and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it causes internal reflections. Let's ignore that for now. The red cats that I have already have the field flattener built in and they're great for solar photography. I've used them for that. Um, I'm not recommending that's the one to get. I'm just saying that I like the ones that I own. So let's take a look at this. So this is the astronomy tools tool. And you can see there's already some drawing on there, but essentially the only things you need to set are, you know, imaging mode, and then you choose the thing that you want, which is the sun. And then you choose the equipment that you have. So you can put in here, uh, instead of focal length, if you don't have a specific telescope, then you can just go over to this box and enter a focal length. And then down here, it's gonna show you the different sizes. So, these pink these boxes correspond to the objectives or lenses that you have over here so you can see this is the sun i have enough the sun is in the center and then you have these other boxes here and here that help you see how much your frame is occupied so um think about this and think about all of this uh, as you're preparing go play with that tool and it'll help you decide what to rent or to bring from your own stock, uh, and it'll help you pre-visualize it. Now, there's other things that come with using a telephoto lens. Guess what? Uh, the Earth is spinning, it's tilted, it's rotating around the sun, and our solar system's spinning in a, heli a helical pattern as it hurtles throughout the universe. Nothing is stationary. So the longer your focal length, the more you're going to amplify and recognize the fact that nothing is stationary in this universe. So that means that you have to keep the sun in your frame. So that's one, the major reason that I say, don't get the longest focal length you can and fill the frame because it's going to keep creeping out of your frame, no matter what you do. Uh, there's also the corona, which happens during totality. And that's going to extend beyond. You saw it in Gabe's pictures, and you'll see other ones. It's going to extend beyond the orb of the sun. And you want to capture all that. You don't want to cut off any of that. That's my suggestion. Maybe you do. Maybe you want to take some closer shots, but you are you probably already know what you're doing if you have a telescope that long. Trackers can require a lot of attention. And this is where I'm going to say it again. If you know how to use your tracker, keep testing. Make sure that it attracts the sun really well because uh, extrasolar objects, things inside of our solar system, move at a different speed than astro objects, things outside of our, our solar system. So uh, you need to make sure that you're tracking the sun and not a star. So there's different kinds of trackers too, but we'll talk about that. There's also gimbals. Gimbals are awesome for photographing wildlife and sports and fashion, stuff like that, because you can, your camera's sort of like, you know, weightless, and you can move it around, uh, but you have to lock those down, right, and once you lock it down, the sun's going to keep moving, but then you can unlock it and move it again, so if you have it some room, you can have it travel through, and then reposition your camera, and then have it travel through again, and then reposition your camera, um, but it helps you find the sun more effortlessly than using it on a ball head, where everything moves all uh, you know, it just, it flops and you're going to spend time, rec you're going to miss some shots that way. Then there's geared heads. Mechanical geared heads are pretty phenomenal. Uh, so if you find the right one, you can just sort of track the sun by turning these little gears a little bit 
and then not have to worry about lo losing your frame entirely. So those are three options that you may consider to help you out. Now here's a real shot that Gabe took of me on location in Capitol Reef. Thank you, Gabe. I don't know why I was I was had my hands on my hips like that. Um, Matt, 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 quick, quick shout out if you don't mind. Someone yeah. in the comments said, you know, all these shots of the clips are great, but don't forget to, sh to photograph behind <laughs> the scenes and the people. And yes, yes, yes to that. Wow, we have so much BTS. <laughs> we could have a separate webinar of just the BTS. <laughs> Gabe did a great job. He took a photograph of every single person and their rig during our workshop. It's 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 wonderful. Uh, so on the left here, you can see that I have uh, my long lens setup, and on the right, you can see that I have my wide setup. Now I didn't call this out, but I'm going to call it out now. On the left, you'll see I have a pano rig. Boop. I have a pano rig because I made a vertorama. I made a two panel shot. I took a large photograph of the foreground to maximize the pixels with a little bit of landscape. And then I tilted it up to get the most amount of sky, but that allowed me to punch in with my focal length to make the suns bigger because I was using a longer focal length for that. Uh, so that's something you might do. You might also notice that it's not my heaviest tripod. Uh, I usually, like this is my trio bow, and we'll talk about that later. But this is the uh, hiking stick set. So I have uh, the basic pod and I have the hiking sticks in one leg there. That's because I destroyed my Achilles tendons and I was still recovering from that at the time. So I had to bring the lightest possible kit. Moving on. Enough about me. Let's talk about general things. You need a camera for your wide setup. You need a camera for your telephoto setup and the corresponding lenses. You should have two tripods. You should have solar filters that match the lenses that you have. And then a fine control head for the long lens, which we talked about. So let's move on from this. And so technical tripod heads, right? We did talk about this, but I'll stress it again. A geared head with manual fine control is really, really good. If you wanted to get uh, automated, your first step out of, into automation would be an equatorial mount. But this happened to one of our attendees during the eclipse, and he was bummed. The equatorial mounts um, counter-rotate against the Earth's rotation, and you point it at the the North Star, essentially. You can't see it during the daytime. But as it gets past a certain point, some equatorial mounts reverse their direction so that they don't go all the way around and everything sort of falls off. That happened three quarters of the way through, and he had to reposition and start following it again. So check your equatorial mount to make sure that that doesn't happen to you. Uh, and practice ahead of time. We'll talk about practice. And then there's go-to trackers, right? A go-to tracker says, here's an object in the sky, find it and follow it. And it uses math and GPS and math and batteries and power to do all of these things. And the one that I use was the Benro Polaris. It's not the only one. It just happened to be the one I have. Uh, and it worked like a charm. I had to reposition three or four times, and you'll see the results a little bit later, um, but I was thrilled with that, and I was using 600 millimeters for that. Stability, support. Hey, we're, we're here because NovaFlex invited us, so thank you, NovaFlex. We really appreciate you. Um, yeah, so the TrioPod Pro 75 is the strongest tripod they have. It holds 143 pounds. If you're going to use super long lenses or a heavy telescope, I recommend the Pro 75. If you're going to use something heavy, but it's not really that gigantic. If you're going to use two things, like the Falcon, you see this here, the Falcon double gimbal. You can put the Falcon double gimbal on the Pro 75 and have two cameras running with long lenses, one for video and one for stills, and then follow along with that. That is a fantastic idea. So you can just hit record on one and then focus on taking pictures with the other one. And it's a super, super awesome way to bring one tripod, one head, and shoot two cameras at the same time. But they both have to be long, right? The Trio Pod M and the Trio Balance are two other great opportunities. The Trio Balance is my everyday tripod. Gabe, it's yours also too, right? Yeah, I, I love the Trio, uh, the Trio Balance, 100%. Yep. I use it primarily because uh, I like to set up and balance out and shoot panos. So you've all heard me talk on and on and on about how much I love my Trio Balance. Uh, I have the Trio Pod M also, and it's 
quite extraordinary. Uh, so every tripod has its uses. And if you have more questions about that, follow the links, ask your questions in chat. Martin is here. Hi, Martin. Oh, now we're going to talk about solar filters. I'm going to, I'm going to kick it off and I'm going to hand it over to Gabe. Um, this is an important section to pay attention to. And the thing I'm going to say now, and Gabe will repeat, is buy your solar filters now. Test them now. Make sure they're the ones that you want to use now before they run out of stock. And thank you, Gabe. And Matt, also, I dropped in the links for the NovaFlex, but there seems to be an error if you don't mind uh, rechecking it. those and, and drop it in. Perfect. Um, so, yeah, uh, the other sort of holy quadruple <laughs> of the of what you need for solar filters, camera, tripod, lens. We've got those three things. However, most important, what if the, you know, what is really the most important and the least expensive is a good solar filter. There are tons of solar filter options out there. In fact, too many. It's very confusing. Help me. How do we navigate the solar filter world? Well, we're going to share it to you three different ways. We're going to give you the good, the better, and the best. Um, and then, you know, we'll let you decide which one kind of fits your lens the best, which one fits your style, budget, et cetera, um, the best. And we're going to give you the sort of the pros and cons of each one because we've, we've pretty much tested them all. I've ordered a, a couple today myself for the ones I haven't tested because I do want to um, test them all and understand them. You know, so and again, it can be the math can be it can be kind of weird to kind of figure them out, especially when we get to the higher end ones. But we're going to help you as much as we can. So first off, the most sort of readily available filters out there are what we call the cardboard filters. Uh, these are generally made by a company called Daystar. You, you see them like this. They come flat. Same sort of company that makes all of the solar filter glasses that we get. So they're using um, they're very inexpensive. And easy to use, if especially though, Matt, you had some challenges, but I remember I had to help you, you know, put the puzzle of the cardboard together. <laughs> calling them out, calling them out. Um, anyways, should be fairly easy to use. They come in sort of ge general sizes that I am going to call a small, medium, and large, uh, but they'll, they'll basically tell you the opening uh, of the diameter, and then you have to measure the diameter of your lens, not the filter size. Photographers out here, I know you're going to say, "Well, I got a 77 millimeter filter." You know, uh, filter. This isn't this isn't a screw-on filter. This is going to go over your lens. You have to measure the uh, the outside of your lens, and also see if it's telescoping. So, if it's telescoping, telescope it out and measure the out exterior of that. Convert that to millimeters, and then these give you sort of a 62 to 80. 80 to, to 80 to 100, they kind of give you a range. So that's nice and it helps them only create three ones, but it doesn't make it a perfect fit for you. So you got to MacGyver it a little bit. I'm sorry if I'm dating myself. I always love MacGyver. He was able to get out of every situation with a nickel, uh, a, a paper clip, and a wish, it seemed like. But basically, you're going to have to finesse it. Um, and whether you bring in extra tape, a little sort of shim or something like that, get these if you have them and then really test it out in, in home and see if it does any vignetting. More on that later. The image quality is good on this. You know, it's not a bad image quality. And what I like about it is it's really warm. It, it, it almost when you take a picture and you have your uh, sun white balance setting, daylight white balance setting on this filter um, gives you a very warm feeling, and that's what I feel when I look at the sun. So Daystar filters, a good option, generally under $20. However, a step up from that, and as photographers, we know all about uh, glass filters, is this will be our better segment. So a step up from that, they're going to, you can either get them uh, screw in, Mount, or I generally prefer getting a square uh, solar filter. For me, you know, when we only have two to four minutes of totality, I want to seize every single moment. So for me to go one, two, three, four turns, however turns it takes with a screw-in filter, um, that's I'm wasting time. 
Whereas when I use a square filter and a filter holder, 100 millimeter, 150 millimeter filter holder, I can just go whoop, I'm out. I'm, I'm right there. And we're now into, I, I missed maybe, a, a, you know, a half a second of totality. So these, now again, there's a lot of marketing out there and uh, photography filter companies have seized upon the solar craze here in the United States. None of them are ISO certified, uh, but we can get into a long debate on who gets ISO certified. Is it really real, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's for another presentation uh, whatsoever. What you want to look for is you want to look for something that at least says it is a solar filter on it. Generally speaking, it is a neutral density filter that is at least 16 stops or more. But I'd like to think there's a few more coatings or a different coating on there for, uh, for, for the ones that market themselves with solar filters. I have been using this Lee filter, the solar filter. Now they have a Mark II version of this. The Mark II loses, is, is over 20 stops of light. This one is not as much. Um, I haven't done the test to figure out specifically, but it's not definitely not 20 stops. But I've used it now for the annular eclipse and the total solar eclipse. And I, I this to me is one of the best image quality and again, ease of use I have I've got. This is, we're looking at about $120 to $150 uh, for a filter. But if you've got, and, and again, remember, if you get the square version of the Lee filter, you need to make sure you have the filter holder already in place. So um, you get truer colors. There's not any color shift that you might see with, say, the Daystar ones. Um, and going through optical glass, not a film is going to give you some of the best image quality out there. So that's my vote for better, the, is the Leaf Solar Filters. Now, we have kind of two in the range of the best. And one is by a company called Thousand Oaks, who has been making solar filters as well as plenty of other uh, telescope filters for many, many years. Uh, they are, right, so they're a professional brand made specifically for this. Theirs is made of a Mylar solar light polymer, though they do have the uh, screw-on filter as well that will have coatings on it. They, uh, Thousand Oaks is CE and ISO certified, so you have that as a, as a, um, as a, a, a piece of mind. There is also quite sharp and a, and a very pleasing yellow-orange, not as orange as the Daystar, but it still is kind of true to with a little bit more um, yellow-orange in it. And these, when you get the slip-on ones, again, I would recommend the slip-on filters as opposed to a screw-in, you have like prongs that you put over and then you tighten the prongs so you can really center it in. But again, these, the math can be tricky to figure out. So make sure you get it, buy it now if you haven't already purchased them, test them at home. When you test them at home, go ahead, point it to the sun uh, or point it to something. And really, we want to check for vignetting. We do not want to have vignetting. So if it vignettes for some reason, then you ordered a smaller size and you need a bigger diameter size uh, for it. But these are great. And where we're seeing now with the use of the Mylar solar light polymer, which is proprietary to Thousand Oaks, now what you're seeing is that improved image quality where you can actually record sharp details like sunspots on the sun. So that's a really cool thing. I noticed it a little bit with my uh, Lee. I was able to get those, but suppose you can get even better results with the uh, Thousand Oaks uh, and any of the Mylar style ones. We've got another one that has been recommended by a friend of ours, Alan Dyer, who's been a eclipser for I don't know, 30 years or something like that. He's going to be speaking at an upcoming uh, conference with us. Really excited to learn more from him. Both Matt and I have read his book over and over again. His top recommendation is uh, this company called Kendrick Optics. So similar to Thousand Oaks, it's going to be a film. They are using, the material they're using uh, is called a Betar Astro Solar Safety Film. Um, this is, they're one of the largest solar film filter manufacturers uh, in the world based up in Canada. So for those in the U.S., it's nice. We get like 
10% off because of the <laughs> conversion. Um, these filters are incredibly, uh, the, the film here is incredibly tough, but when you get it, you will notice that it's kind of wrinkly. Um, this does not show in the image quality at all. In fact, um, it really, it, it doesn't affect it. And there is a, as they quote, an exquisite sharpness from edge to edge while also balancing a comfortable image brightness. So here's the thing. When we look at like something like the Lee or any of the photo filters, we're talking about using glass optics, good, but we're also talking about using neutral density and knocking off anywhere from 16 to 20 stops of light. That's gonna be a challenge, right? Even though we'll be shooting the sun directly to take away 16 to 20 stops, that means we'll be shooting at higher ISOs, uh, more open apertures, and probably shooting at hopefully shutter speeds, you know, that are at least 250th of a second, but might have to go down slower than that. So that's the balance. Um, again, I've shot with the glass leaf filters and I've shot as low as I believe like almost a half a second and it's everything's have gotten sharp, but I've also had a few sl uh, blurry ones with that slower shutter speed too. So just be aware of that. Um, and that these filters aren't going to be knocking off as much light as the uh, the optical ones will be. Matt, this is your setup. I love it. I want one. <laughs> but, I, but I want a Sherpa to carry it for me too. Right? right. <laughs> you know how I said the, the Pro 75 is a beast? Um, yeah, it's a, uh, this is what the pro 75 is what I use whenever I put a telescope objective on top, especially the red cat 71, mm -hmm. which is a, a big objective. So, uh, this is it with the thousand Oaks filter on it, which has a, a, a foam that comes with it that helps when you, you put it on, it's a press fit and you can apply just the right amount of foam to make sure that it, it doesn't have any light leaks and it fits snugly. Nice. Um, but this is what I shot those tests with, this setup right here. Uh, so I got the Pro 75 and a, and a ball head uh, at the time just to run the tests. Um, and yeah, this thing is as sharp as heck. Uh, I did find that the Thousand Oaks, uh, as you see in the pictures, has a really, really orange quality to it, especially if you're, you're color managed. You know, like it's just going to, um, if you're running it as, as daylight and you're shooting as daylight, it's going to be that. You could, of course, neutralize if you want to or adjust the color temperature to taste afterwards. Uh, but, yeah, with the telescope, that's what that's what happens. Now, we had a question uh, in the comments um, about how many stops the Thousand Oaks uh, decreases it by. I actually don't know the number, but I can go look it up. We'll answer you in the chat. What other, Matt, one other thing I forgot to mention about the Kendrick's filter. I purchased mine today. Um but I, and I, and on, their, on their website, they have a price increase starting on the 12th of January. So you've oh. got a couple days to just kind of save a little money. Again, they're not that expensive. I think I spent about $80 on mm -hmm. one. Um, so, but again, note that, you know, get your filters now. Starting in, in a month before, they're going to be hard to get. And, and the price will now be jacked up. So. Yep. And that, that link to the Kendrick's filters is up in the chat. If you scroll up, you'll see it says kendricksastro.com in it. So, um, some final thoughts. You mind if I wrap up for you? Or you want to talk? Go for more? it. Go for it. If, if you get solar film, which you can get in ten by ten or twelve by twelve squares, I forget what it was from Thousand Oaks. It's a great thing to get a sheet of that to bring along for emergencies, right? Perhaps somebody you're with messed up their filter or they forgot it or something you can be save the day just by buying one of those 12 by 12 sheets um but no matter what you do your solar filter always has to be the first thing it has to be between the sun and whatever else you're doing it can't be inside the camera it can't be on the other side of like binoculars or something it has to be prior to that because everything in the optical path is going to focus that energy from the sun and imagine just using a magnifying glass on ants as a kid. Yeah, I, we all did it, right? Uh, that's what's happening, right? So you want to put the solar filter in front of everything. Um, so if you got that, if you get the solar film, the easiest is to get it from Thousand Oaks. It's very reliable. Gabe talked about Kendrick, right? Um, 
when I measured mine, I had a Red Cat 71. You have to do your own math. You'll see it. But I, I measured the outside of my telescope, which is how they recommend doing it, of course, has 98 millimeter outer diameter, and my Red Cat 71 has 76. So you'll have to figure out for yourself how big to order the right thing to fit whatever lenses or lens hoods you're using. You can put it on a lens hood too, but the further out it is, the bigger it has to be. So I'd recommend putting it on the end of your lens barrel and not your lens hood. I posted all of these links in the chat. There's more things to look at. You also, uh, you can look at the, the best recommended list of solar filters here, the aas.org. That is a very reliable list of accredited suppliers for solar filters. Um, and then the solar glasses, you just, we're going to say it over and over. D don't look at the sun without solar glasses. Okay, let's move on. You're adults. All right, so let's talk about um, the process, the shooting pro uh, note process behind this, the wide angle composite example from 2017. So this was the, uh, I was set up with a couple people here in this room, Klaus and uh, who else I see in here. I got a, we got a couple, Jerry, exactly. We got a couple of those people that were right beside me and experiencing this. It was amazing. Shot this with uh, Nikon 14 to 24. This is my wide angle setup. And uh, with that 14 to 24, I shot at 20 millimeter. So here was sort of the behind the scenes, the thought process about it and that I can share with you. First off, I pre-focused on the sun uh, with the filter on and set to a manual focus. Once I got my focus on the sun, I did a landscape shot. I should say that. Sorry, I did a landscape shot first, focus on the mountains. Then, I, and this is before the sun came into my uh, frame, then I focused on the sun, got that more infinite distance, just to be specific, uh, and then set my uh, autofocus to manual focus so that I would have no shift unless I moved it uh, specifically. A, a smart thing to do, again, if you want to do this wide angle composite shot is set up an interval to shoot every four to five minutes once you've kind of done your testing to figure out your exposure. And as you can see, I kind of, you can either turn and do that if the sun has, has risen uh, above that sort of 20 degrees and gotten through the haze, the, our, 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 you know, the earth's haze, and it's kind of above that 20, 30 degrees. Um, you can kind of get your base exposure that then is, for the most part, not going to shift too much from there. So the, the um, you know, the, the sun basically, we rotate, sun rotates, we, we, it's, it's enough that every four to five minutes, you will not overlap your, um, your sun and your moon. Okay. So if you shoot every four to five minutes, you'll have sort of, and, and do it regularly, then you'll have perfectly spaced and, uh, you know, the eclipse shots. That's a good way to go. You know, Matt will talk a little bit later. He shot every like 10 seconds and created a time lapse. So there's different modes of, of, of shooting. Strategize about that, what you want to do. I definitely, I'm going to show you how I, I process this. I overshot this. I did shoot every four minutes. However, I also, you know, when we were getting really close to um, the, uh, the the total eclipse, I was shooting a little bit more just because maybe I want to use a different uh, a different bite out of the sun instead. So, but if you keep it on the regular, then there'll be less heavy lifting later in post. So I basically set it up to shoot every four minutes. My settings uh, before the sun came into the frame were uh, one thousandths of a second, F16 at ISO 800. My settings with my Daystar filter. So that's how I got my base shot. Okay. My settings with my Daystar filter, once the sun came into the frame, so let's see, it, it's, it uh, cut off about the Daystar filter, cut off about two to three stops of light there. So I went from 1,000 to 125th, and I also went down to F8. So actually, so what, 500, 250, so it, it took off uh, four stops of light, that Daystar filter, okay? Um, and I adjusted accordingly. I didn't need to be at F16 anymore, um, I, but I wanted to, you know, shutter speed prioritize for the, the absolute uh, sharpness of the uh, the sun moon eclipse during a totality 
And we're all going to have to, you know, these are my settings. You know, these are what I would say a good jumping off point. You definitely want to bracket uh, throughout and find the settings that are best for you, how high the sun is, how bright the sun is, any clouds, what filter you use, et cetera, et cetera. My settings uh, for totality, once I took that filter off, were, you know, not too far off. So I said the Daystar took away four stops of light. So that was, you know, when I took it off, I was pretty close. All I had to adjust was actually one more stop of my shutter speed. I, F8 was still constant, 800 ISO, and then I was at 50th of a second. Now, again, I bracketed and it went from 50th of a second all the way down to a half a second, okay? And like I said, some of my half a second shots are sharp. Ideally, I wouldn't be bracketing my shutter speed. This is my first eclipse I shot. I was just trying to juggle one ball at a time. I would really have, it in the future, what I did at the annual eclipse or what I'll do at the future solar eclipse, I'll keep that shutter speed the same and let the ISOs fly. I'll raise up my ISOs to 3,200, 6,400 if need be. Um, so I didn't, you know, I, I, I probably, sh of my shots at 50 second below, my hit rate was still 80, 80, 80 to 90%. But again, be wary of just, just letting, adjusting, uh, just bracketing the shutter speed. Um, I would again, recommend bracketing the ISO. Now, again, when the totality was over, I put the filter back on and my settings were a little bit brighter, about one stop brighter. Um, I think... No, or yeah, they're actually one stop dimmer. So I was at a one thousandth of a second f8 instead of 16. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm looking at sorry the before one thousandth of a second with the filter right. So it was it was significantly brighter, and I lowered my ISO uh, with that to one thousandth of a second f8 to ISO 100. Um, oh, yeah, that one the settings were after the eclipse was over completely, and I wanted to get a shot of the sun in the shot to kind of get the feeling of the landscape. So overall, but we look at that at the beginning, settings beginning before the sun came out, where it was one stop. No, it was because I shifted 800 to 100. So it was about three stops brighter when it was like up in the sky at nine and then when it was up in the sky at 12, okay? So total solar eclipse telephoto considerations Again, this is, you're going to have your filter on, focus on that edge of that sun, and then set it to manual focus. Okay, you might have to zoom in, but hopefully with the filter on, it's not blocking off so much that you can't focus on the uh, sun itself. But choose the edge. Remember, autofocus looks for contrast. That contrast is at the edge. I talked about the interval of your choice, but at least about every four to five minutes, it will depend, be dependent upon how... Um, how, what your lens is and how much you're zoomed in and, and magnifying it. But generally a safe, a safe, uh, a safe spot is about four to five minutes in between shots. And here's the settings. This was 300 millimeter on an APS-C size sensor. So this was the equivalent of a 450 millimeter lens. For the eclipse itself, again, settings with the Lee square solar filter were 125th F8 I at ISO 800, when that sun gets to that crescent, just be ready, ready to go. There's a diamond ring effect at the beginning and at the end is that last lick of it. And when I was reviewing my, my total solar eclipse shots, I missed the first uh, diamond ring effect because I hadn't, I didn't take off my filter, but boy, did I get the second one and we'll see, see about that. That was like one of the things I definitely wanted to get. So I was a little slow to take off this filter. But because during that filter, when the filter time, we're getting to see the Bailey's beads, you know, and all this other good stuff uh, going on. Definitely bracket. This is a time where now you're going to be losing, you know, losing stops as, as the sun gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. So make sure you're bracket. And again, I would be bracketing ISOs, prioritize. And then if you have to, uh, shutter speeds, apertures from there. There's the diamond ring effect. So this is a shot you definitely want to get. And I, I have to say, this shot was unlike any others that I saw out at the time. I, I saw pictures, I studied this effect, and I said, well, this is a direct light source. 
if I shoot at a small aperture, I'm going to get more of that starburst effect. I'm going to get, you know, more of the beams. It's going to, it's going to really heighten it out. And I think I was, at least for 2017, I was one of the few people who did that, right? So I was shooting at F22. Again, that made me, and again, this is a 15th of a second. It's sharp. We got a little bit of the Corona as well, but it's about finding that balance. But I'm sharing this secret with you, okay? The diamond ring effect, if you can stop down that filter, you'll get a shot similar to this, okay? So if you stop down that aperture ring, you'll get that, you'll, you really heighten those beams. Maybe you don't like that. You know, look at other shots. Google, you know, diamond ring and look at all the images out there. This is the one that's got the most prominent, um, the, that starburst effect that I have seen out there. If you don't like it, then shoot at a moderate one. Again, you know, it's hard to say. Each lens has a different effect with it. This one was with the Fuji 100 to 400 lens on the APS-C size sensor, and it was a 450 millimeter uh, equivalent. This happens, the diamond ring happens very quickly. I think I was able to fire off eight shots with bracketing. Um, so really be on for this moment. You really want to get this moment before and after um, the total eclipse. And then the corona. This is, I think, what we all live for uh, with being in the umbra is to get the corona. And this is when we can take the filter off. We've, we, we said Again, I wasn't, I was losing about four or five stops, you know, for this and bracketing like crazy. Again, this is a 15th of a second shot here, but I went all the way down to a half a second and all the way up to 50th of a second. Luckily with Corona this year, uh, we'll have hope, four minutes to experiment with it. Hopefully at least three minutes, you know, for most of you. But what I'll say is bracket, enjoy it. As, as um, Jerry mentioned and, and Matt mentioned, the corona extends, look at it, it extends almost twice the size of the moon, right? If you think about it as, as, as the sun. So think about almost leaving in your framing sort of a, um, a sun's width all the way around minimally. I also say that I looked at the lenses for shooting the annular eclipse. We were looking at choosing between a 100 to 400 and a 200 to 500 or 600 lens. And I really opted for the 100 to 400. I would rather opt for a higher resolution camera and a slightly less telephoto lens. That'll just help balance things, um, just to make sure that we have enough breathing room uh, to make sure that anything else happens. There was a time, um, I believe when it was, it was the turn of the century, it was like 1917, there's an eclipse where a comet was captured as well during the uh, during totality. And it was it was fairly close to it, but if you were shooting super tight, you might've missed it. So you just definitely know if there are planets, you might be able to see other planets, stars, if you shoot a little bit more looser uh, to include that. So that's my, um, my recommendation. And the other recommendation for the total solar eclipse is to also leave your camera alone and look up and enjoy it. Give yourself at least 10 seconds minimal and if you can't afford it, 30 seconds to really just enjoy it with your own eyes. My memory of this experience was looking down at my LCD screen, right? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, was I there? Was I really there? I mean, I remember the, the, the quietude of it all and everything and, and, and us like kind of the, the hoots and the hollers of our small little group and stuff like that. But I, I, I only probably gave myself a few seconds, if anything, to look up to it. Now, I'm very happy with the shots. I'm glad I was focused. But now, I can, from experience, I can say, do not forget to just enjoy it. Ah, all right, Matt. Take us away with this amazing clockwork shot. <laughs> on. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, so when you're shooting an annular eclipse uh, or a partial eclipse, I think we've said it before, but it's really worth repeating. Leave your solar filter on the whole time. Otherwise, you could damage your camera gear. You could damage your eyesight. Just leave it on. Um, consider shorter intervals for if you're going to shoot a time lapse. Uh, what does that mean? Well, when I shot the annular eclipse, I was tracking it. 
and I think I had 850 photographs. And you get to see the results soon. Uh, and also, you want to shoot for the composite also, right? So this was at 550 millimeters on the, the Nikon Z 150 to 600 lens. Um, and all of these stages were shot uh, tracked. Um, and I shot them at ISO 50 with that solar filter at f6.3 on uh, a 1250th of a second. Uh, so this, uh, when I was looking for a way to express what happened visually, to me, the, the sort of clockwork layout lended itself to speaking about the passage of time, too. And we'll talk about artistry also, but that's why I laid it out the way that I did. It also fits nicely into a square, which is easy to share. So uh, without further ado, Gabe and I are actually going to turn off our cameras and turn off our mics. I'm going to play you a video. Uh, this is the entire eclipse, the annual eclipse tracked from start to finish uh, using uh, the Nikon Z8. I think it's the Z8 that I shot on. Uh, yes. Uh, and here we go. Uh, at the end of this, I'm just going to sort of talk over the end of it here. I put this to music because I wanted people to have an experience that was worthy of the effort to put into it. So um, that's uh, that's primarily what I what I wanted to do was with this. I I wanted I wanted people to to feel what it was like to be there. So music helps with that. But as photographers, we may or may not always think about all of the outputs that we could have. And one of the outputs of using a long lens is turning it into uh, a time lapse. So in this case, it, no matter how good your tracker is, uh, you're probably going to have to align all of those images. The dirty secret part of this is that I spent a, a long time realigning all of these images manually because no automatic method that I could find <laughs> could align all of these and so perfectly so i i'm not going to tell you how many hours i spent in the 105 gigabyte psd that i have aligning all 850 layers but it was significant so well well worth it matt well worth it that was uh amazing the music was was uh beautiful too wow all right um, so, we've got more but wait there's more there's a we're going to show you guys a little bit of what it takes to post-process this. So Gabe's going to share his screen and show you a little bit of what it takes to uh, put together the wide composite in Photoshop. And then I'll show you a little bit about the telephoto composite. Perfect. Okay. So here we go. Let's see. I'm going to share my entire screen. There, there it is. There's that. Okay. And actually, let's go over to here. Um, this is uh, first, I, you know, as far as the composite goes, right, we're, we're collecting a lot of information and then we are going to um, bring it into Photoshop. This, uh, putting the composite together is quite similar to what you might um, see 
uh, what you might do for those of you who are night photographers, and I know there's a lot of night photographers in this room, is what you might do in uh, for creating star trails. So it's actually kind of easy if you get do the right things prior, right, and and collect the right information, and don't bump, don't move things, et cetera, et cetera. So let me just show you. Let's see. So what I've done here's here's you can see all the shots that I took that morning. Uh, so again, here's here's the shot here that was uh, did a couple bracketing just to figure out the best exposure up here before the sun came into view. I really like the composition over the Sawtooth Mountains. And then obviously when you see here, the ones that are flagged red, these are all the shots that I took with the filter. And again, this is that Daystar filter. And then here, over here, we can start seeing the um, the sun in it. And, it. and I started shooting it just as it started getting a little bite of it taken out. What you can see and what I kind of warned you about also when we look at this is the vignetting that's happening, right, with the cardboard ones. And if, if it wasn't not flush up against um, your, uh, your, your lens, and this goes for any of them, if it's not flush up against, if you, you know, then you're going to get vignetting. Can be solved, but it's, it's, it's a bit of a pain to take care of. So you can then see the, uh, let's see, over 120 photographs I took, um, barely see the transit. But here's sort of my base shot here. And then we'll see, these are kind of some of my finals versions that I have here. And this is how I ended. Uh, I ended with a shot like this, just to give myself another option of a foreground. Um, and I might actually go back, This that's actually a nice, hold on, that's the final version. Uh, I kind of like this foreground. I might have to go back and revisit and just pop this one in there. Um, the other thing that I might experiment with that I, you know, is how do we get, you know, the, the, the question with this shot is how do we get the true light of the eclipse, right? Um, you know, I took a shot before, so the, when, the, when the sun was mostly get, coming from that direction without a filter on, and here I am at the end, uh, so I have both selections. I saw Mike Shaw and I did another version of it. Of, you have the eclipse with this at the end of it. That's another choice. And then you can use this light from it. I might, and I'm telling you, this is just an idea right now, and you're more than welcome to, to join me in this experiment as well, is I might, during the totality, I might try to also get a shot of the landscape. Okay. So Typically, we're just really worried about, you know, getting the proper exposure for the uh, the eclipse happening what, during totality. But given that we have four minutes and given that I'm allotting myself at least 20, 30 seconds to enjoy it, I might bracket extremely and also get a shot of the landscape so that we get the true light. Because it is a surreal twilight, soft light that, that is out there. And we're not getting that from the direct hit of the moonlight. So that's something... I didn't try, um, and you can't do it for the, the annular eclipse. I guess you could um, risk take your filter off for just a little bit, but that's something I might try. So once you have all your images and you find all of the ones, which I've now marked with red, uh, this in Lightroom is quite easy to do. Uh, using the numbers six through nine, you can pick a color. I pick when I'm going to blend things together. Um, I mark them red, and then what I'll do is I'll, I'll then – kind of go to my attribute and say, okay, just show me the red. So then I can just hit uh, control all. And now I just have only the eclipse shots plus this foreground shot of my choice. Well, then again, this could be, uh, you know, we're going over something that you probably already know. Again, if you do star trails, but we go into a photo, edit in, and then open as layers in Photoshop. Now I've already opened these up for you to save us about five minutes. And we can see that this is what it looks like over here. Um, is we've got basically the shot because uh, our blend mode is just normal. It's just showing that first shot, which is of the landscape. What we'll do now is we'll go in and select all of the layers. So we have the first layer selected right here. We'll go to the bottom layer, select all, and change our blend mode to lighten. Okay, and that's going to bring forward the all the bright parts of the of the scene. So we've now got the vignetting going on in here. That's quite visible. 
Uh, unfortunately, we've got a little bit of the um, we've got a little bit of the flare of the sun just out of frame over here. But let's just take a look at sorry the um, how these lined up. Now, what I'll say is these line up pretty good um, because again, this was every four minutes. But I've also done some work here, and 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 if we don't do it every four minutes, if we do it four minutes plus. Uh, also kind of just getting some other shots uh, with it, then you can kind of see I've kind of marked ones in red where I've got, I think, one way out of frame. Here's this one. That first frame is this is where I started testing over there. And I'm like, nope, nope, that's still too close. I want it kind of more in the middle. So we're going to take that one off. And any of these ones, these layers that you see that don't have an eyeball or are marked in red, these are ones I, I had to go through and edit out. And I'm just either doing this, you can see that one was an overlap. I, I shot it two minutes just because I was really examining uh, the bite of the of the, uh, of the the sun. Um, but I think if I do this next time, I'm just going to kind of settle in, maybe test it a little bit out here, but settle in and, and get it, agree upon every four minutes, five minutes, whatever it might be, um, and then do the... Uh, and then just do, let it do like let it do it as it is. The uh, total clips I had quite a few options of those. There's that one. So it's before that. That must be no. Nope, that one's before that. That must be one of these jammers. You can kind of see some of these. I, I had a few different ones. I just went with that one. And there's something wrong with this one that we'll fix, of course. Um, but. The first thing I'm going to, to notice here is, or first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to, uh, now that I've got everything aligned, again, simply with the blend mode and lighten, I want to get rid of all the other extraneous light sources in the scene. Now, really, this vignette is in every shot, and I've got about 80 shots here. That is going to be a tedious affair, but with Lightroom, we can actually make this uh, go away quite easily. I'm going to select everything but so i'll select oops on right, here i'll select oh you can't select all i forgot i'm going to go in every all of them except for that that uh, foreground shot so here i am i've selected all of them and then i'm going to turn these into a group i'm going to right click and a group from layer select that so now and i'll just call that you can call it group one or you can yeah just call it group one is that really only going to have one group? And what I'm going to do now, now what any adjustment I do, you know, aligned with this one is going to affect everything in that group. So this is a time saver. Um, and let's just fit the screen there uh, with that. So what I want to do basically is I want to mask out all of the offending vignette highlights that we see here. So I'm going to go down here to the uh, layer mask, create a mask that is linked to that folder, to that group. And then I'm going to go to my brush. I'm going to make sure we have uh, we have black brush and that is going to remove and basically remove all of those uh, effects that are going that are in all of the other images. Now again, it's not removing, that flare because that's in the base shot. So what are we going to do with that? I want to re I want to remove that flare. I find that offending. Well, let's go to that image, that layer. And what I can do is I'm going to just make a selection. I'm going to take my lasso tool, and I'm just going to select all of this offending flare. It goes all the way down to there and go all the way up. Okay. And Photoshop has made this super easy. There's a couple different ways we can do it. Um, I'm going to go up into edit. You can do it either in content aware fill or the new generative fill. This is, again, both of these are using AI technology to look around it and to put in uh, whatever it, it sees. But the generative fill is sort of the new one. You can add a prompt to it, but this is you don't. If you don't add a prompt, it is just going to uh, look at what's around it and fill it appropriately with the uh, hopefully the blue light, the blue tonalities that are in the rest of the scene. It did a fairly good job. I see this one, that is a little there. So let's go over here. And now let's try the, 
the uh, data content aware fill. This one you can have a little bit more control over. And when you select it, you have to make the selection first, then go to edit content aware fill. This is saying I need to make it make that sort of brush. So I'm going to just go gently around the corner. I don't want to around the edges. I don't want to go and hit any of the um, the suns there. Oh, and this just did actually a worse job, but we can kind of look here and we can kind of say, okay, it's getting too dark up there. Maybe not so much over here. And it's showing us a little bit and we can kind of refine the selection and play around with this some more. And that's looking better, but I think I, I made not as good of a selection. And I think in the end, that generative fill did a better job. This you can finesse till the cows come home. Um, but that's just sort of a, an extra step I wanted to show you. When you look at this final image, I also kind of cropped it right kind of down there um, to make this a little bit more prominent. I know people also will make these layers bigger um, than it. I stay true to my focal length on it. But that is something that if you do it, then you go from science to artist and um, just shout it out. T tell us that you did it in it. it. Creatively, yes, it might be the right choice. But now we're moving away from was this accurately captured and created or was it amplified with your artistic choice? So whatever way you do, um, just make sure you, you, you share it and explain it. Uh, I think I mentioned in the comments, we do live in a, a golden age of sharing our knowledge. And, and that's the co that cool thing. If you actually look at the history of eclipses from the beginning, they there was always a, a desire to share. We needed the information, not just from our spot, but from spots all around. What did the eclipse look like there? What did the eclipse look like there? We didn't have that knowledge. We wouldn't know how big the path of totality was a thousand, two thousand years ago. So we all needed to work together to understand it. And that still plays true today. That's it, Matt. You're up. <laughs> amazing. Freaking amazing. All right. We're, we're kind of coming in for a landing here, folks. I have, I'm going to share uh, a little bit of what I did to, to show that. So, um, here is, uh, my Lightroom. I just wanted to show you really quickly from that video. These are all of the single images that I shot that were tracked. So you can see that there's a bunch of images. You get that, right? Um, they all have synchronized things that have happened to them. What I did was uh, I, I use a uh, certain uh, color management. You might have seen uh, other things that I've presented about this. But I have a custom color camera profile that I apply that's for daylight. It's based on science. Um, so I applied that and not much else. And I applied that to everything else. And then I took just the ones that I wanted and I put them into separate layers in Photoshop. And I also, I believe I, I made a grid. So you can see that grid here. And I made everything exactly uh, one. Uh, let me duplicate this so I can show you. I made this one. Uh, sun ex distance away from everything on purpose so that I'd have symmetry uh, and then I made it go away. So um, that's how I made this one. I made a variety of different composites. I made the the horizontal one that you saw. I tried the diagonal one that uh, other people have done. Um, and I, I ended up liking this one the best because I said it sort of represents like a watch face. It's temporal. It's time-based. Uh, and I like it. Um, I did talk about how I aligned everything for the time lapse, but I'm not going to go into that now because we've already run, we've run pretty long here, you know, so um, it has been really fun sharing all this stuff with you guys. Um, but we have some more stuff to talk about. Homework. We want you to have some homework. So number one, if you don't own them already, uh, get your solar filters now. Number two, inspect your solar filters if you already have them. Uh, if they have pinpricks or scratches, replace them. 
because that can damage, uh, that'll ruin your photographs and it da could damage your eyes or your equipment. Uh, so it's just cheaper to replace them. The real number two is to practice it. Once you receive your filters, get out there on clear days. Uh, wherever you're going to be, figure out how high the sun is going to be in the sky. Set your camera up. Find your focal length. Work on your composite shot. Work on your exposures with the filter. You can't practice for totality, but you'll figure it out, the totality part, when you pull the filter off during the eclipse. You got to leave your filter on when you're doing solar photography, right? So work on all that stuff and enjoy the eclipse while it happens. Because the more practice you do it now, the more you're going to enjoy it then, the less panic you're going to have, as Steve described it. <laughs> now, we have an ebook on our website, uh, which we uh, have right now, which you can download, which has information that uh, we published the last time for the one in. 2017 but we're going to have a new one coming out shortly if you follow this link you can uh put your email address in there and, and we'll let you know when that's going to happen the one that's existing right now has some different information that we've shared today uh it's a pay whatever you want you can pay zero it doesn't matter you're not going to hurt our feelings or you can pay something that's also great right so there's that ebook there um, and then the new one, of course, is coming up with updated information about more annular and totality stuff. So thanks for checking that out. Uh, link in the chat here. It'll also be in the, the recap. Um, next thing we're really excited about, you might have seen us talking about it. If you're part of our social channels, the Night Photo Summit is happening. Look at what Gabe's wearing. It's February 2nd through 4th. This is over 30 world-class speakers talking about all the topics in night photography and science and art. Uh, it's three days of fun. It's an online virtual conference. It's at nightphotosummit.com. Gabe's going to post that link in there. Sign up today. It's a boatload of fun. This is the fourth year we've done it. We have a lot of fun running it. And we get to sit with our peers from the educational industry and all sit under each other's learning trees. And everybody has a lot of fun. And there's a ton of prizes. NovaFlex is a sponsor. Uh, thank you, NovaFlex, for, for being there, supporting us and supporting the Night Photo Summit. Also, shout out, there will be an Eclipse class there from Alan Dyer. So that's that, right. you, want, you want to learn more, yep. you know, in this two hours, we haven't given you Alan Dyer as we witnessed more and experienced more than Matt and I and many of us probably combined. So oh, definitely gosh. want to check that out. That man's amazing. Also, we're thrilled to also have NovaFlex help seeing. And you can see Martin is right here in this picture. Oh, I got to turn the drawing back on. Martin was there at the first one. He's right there. Nightscaper.com. This is our in-person conference. This will be in Kanab, Utah, September 2024. Please join us there. Consider buying a ticket and coming. Uh, we've got some more fun stuff coming up, too. Uh, this is going to be a blast. This is a little bit more focused on astro landscape photography and straight astro photography, deep space stuff. Uh, and there's a little bit more leaning bias towards science with this one, too. So the science and art together. And then, of course, we teach workshops, if you couldn't tell. We're uh, embarking on season nine this year. And it's hard to believe, but it's absolutely wonderful. So we've a lot of, got a lot of good stuff. Gabe's going to post a link to our season nine workshops here. Um, there's spots open for some incredible photo tours and workshops out there. If you'd like to join us to go have fun taking pictures in extraordinary places or learning more about how to do it or both, follow the link and join us. Um, also, thank you so much. Um, here's all of our socials. You know, we want to show you this. Um, please join us on social media if you haven't already. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the places, or X if you call it that. Uh, and then we have our websites here, and Gabe will post these links individually so they don't get all jumbled together. Um, also, uh, yeah, thank you all very much. Thank you, NovaFlex, for hosting this. Gabe, this is the first time you and I have presented for NovaFlex together. Man, that was that was a barrel of monkeys. Thank woo. you so much. It's two hours, two hours, so woo. <laughs> um, 
we we I think Eunice is asking too. If this this is recorded, Eunice. You'll get you'll get uh, emailed if you registered. You'll get emailed what in a couple days. Yeah, so, it usually takes me one to two days to to put all this together. Okay. Uh, so yeah, awesome. And a lot of thanks, a lot of love out there in the comments. Thank you, thank you all for spending almost two hours with us uh, going over the eclipse, um, what to expect, how to prepare, and how to photograph um, the eclipse. So we really hope, uh, Matt, it was an awesome to, to, to ex you know, I, we've experienced this together. This, again, was yet another experience to kind of just get those gears going and get ready uh, for it. It's less than, you know, three months away. Yeah. So um, I hope that you all get to really enjoy uh, the total solar eclipse that is coming through North America on April 8th. And we implore you, just practice now so you can enjoy it then. Yeah, get it all out of the way. <laughs> so uh, uh, thanks, Novaflex. Thanks, Brenda. Thanks, Martin. Thanks, Gabe. Uh, and thanks to everyone who attended and everybody who's going to watch this on the replay. We appreciate you all. Um, so I see one question in the Q&A that uh, okay. Kathy is asking, recommended bracketing spread for partial and totality. Oh, right. Um, yes. I, I think if I'm looking at my math correctly, uh, I was bracketing between about four to five stops with the gear I had. So, you know, I would say expect to do that, about four to five stops. But again, if you're using you know, something like a 16 to 20 stop ND filter, you know that, okay, then you're going to have to get back up to it. But once you find your base exposure during totality or during partial, then go around that, I would say, set your bracketing, put it in bracketing mode, plus or minus five stops. That's a great way to kind of do it. You'll, you'll, you'll get, you'll, you'll have plenty of options there. Yeah. All right. Wow. So, uh, I'm I'm speechless because I think we've said all, all the words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's good. Hugs, Gabe. Hugs to all the attendees. Hugs to all the replay watchers. Uh, we can't wait to see you in the comments. And now we're gonna go have a tall glass of water. <laughs> all right, sounds good. Thank you all, and we'll see you on the eighth somehow, somewhere. That's right. Take care, everybody. <laughs>